Hello and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving the over 100,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM's members. My name is Alexei Villas-Boas. I'm the head of technology at ThoughtWorks Brazil, and I've been working in the IT industry for around 20 years, playing several different roles, such as developer, team leader, IT manager, and executive leader. My main research interests include software development methodologies, organizational transformation, systems architecture, and computational algebra. But enough about me. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM learning centered resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in global environments. ACM provides timely computing information published by ACM, including communications of the ACM and Q magazines, access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, and international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics and support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing, and ACM Infosys Foundation Awards. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you are experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command R if you're on a Mac, or refresh your browser on mobile device. Or you can close and relaunch the presentation. To control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. And if you have questions during this webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click the Submit button. I will organize questions as Luciano speaks, and he'll reserve time at the end of the presentation to address them. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. And check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out to help us improve our webinars. You may also open the survey at any time throughout the presentation from the menu dock at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag ACMLearning. We will be watching for your tweets. And today's presentation is Generators, Powering Iteration in Python by Luciano Ramalho. Luciano is a technical principal at ThoughtWorks and the author of the popular O'Reilly books title Fluent Python, available to ACM members in the ACM Learning Center. Hamalio was a web developer before the Netscape IPO in 1995 and has worked on some of the largest news portals in Brazil using Python since 1998. He has spoken multiple times at OSCON, PyCon, Python Brazil, Fizzle, and Rupai. Hamalio is a fellow of the Python Software Foundation and co-founder of Garoa Hacker Club, the first hackerspace in Brazil. He is a member of ACM as well as of the ACM Special Interest Group on Computer Service Education. Luciano, without further delay, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Alexei. Uh, I want to thank uh, the ACM, especially uh, Ian, who invited me to make this presentation. I have now started to share my screen. Uh, the, the slides are available uh, for download at speakerdeck.com slash Hamalio. That's my last name. Uh, but I'm going to do screen sharing because I may be tempted to do live demos at some point. So let's get started. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, generators in Python and understand why laziness can be considered a virtue in the context of computing. 
Uh, I, like Alexei said, I'm a technical principal at ThoughtWorks, and I also wrote this book, which has been translated to several languages. But let's get started. So iteration. That's what computers are for, right? You want uh, computers because you need to process uh, thousands, millions, or billions of, of data items. Uh, you know, in the, in the most important uh, language uh, of all time, in the C language, this is how iteration looks like. Uh, uh, this is a fairly low level uh, uh, take on iteration because uh, this for loop construct requires you to manage this index, right? So I'm not really interested in that index, but I have to have it because that's the way that I will reach the elements in the array. Uh, in contrast, uh, a Python program that does exactly the same thing is much cleaner not only because of the simpler syntax, but most importantly because of the fact that we are not uh, handling that index. We are getting the values that we need uh, one by one. Uh, so we don't, we don't run the risk of uh, off by one errors and other problems that can arise with the more uh, general form of the for loop in C. In fact, the way that C does looping is so uh, primitive that it actually looks very much like an assembly instruction. The x86 instruction set has a, loops, a loop construct that basically decrements a counter and loops back or forward depending on uh, whether that counter has or not reached zero. Now let's consider uh, the evolution of uh, the for loop in Java. Before Java, Java 5, this is how you would write that same program. And after Java 5, this is how you would write it. So this second version is much better because, again, uh, I don't have to deal with the, the I counter. Uh, I get the arguments, uh, the, the command line arguments, one by one directly on that arg uh, variable. So uh, as a Python evangelist, I, I, I've been using for a while this slide that shows that uh, the so-called enhanced for or for each loop arrived in, in Python much earlier than it did in, in Java. But of course, uh, the history of this construct did not start in 1991. In fact, it started uh, with Barbara Liskov, the second woman to win, to win the, the Turing Award from the ACM. Uh, her language, the Clue language, was not very popular, but it was highly influential. Uh, the Clue language introduced, among other concepts, uh, exception handling in a way that's very similar to how Java and Python do it. And also it introduced, introduced the concept of uh, iterator functions, which uh, we're going to be talking much more about uh, in the next slides. Anyway, so this is how the story of uh, the, the way Python does iteration really started. This is a page, the second page of the Clue uh, reference manual, and then you can see highlighted there uh, the for loop that looks very much like the for loop in Python. Uh, basically, what you see there with leaf column node, leaf is the type of the node variable, so the variable is being declared right there, and then it's going to receive each of the results that the leave uh, iterator will uh, use. So basically, the, the reason why this for each loop works is because Python, Java, and Clue let programmers define iterable objects. So what, what goes in that second position after the in keyword in the for in construct has to be an iterable, an expression that produces an iterable. Uh, uh, we may take it for, for granted if we use those languages, but in fact, uh, not, lots of languages don't offer this flexibility. C has no concept of iterables at all. And in the Go language, which is a, a great language that I'm enjoying studying, uh, and it's a modern language, uh, you can't really create uh, iterable objects. Some built-in objects in Go are iterable, but uh, the, uh, the, the Go designers don't give 
us the power to create our own iterables. You have to use the ones that they provided us. So let's talk from a little bit more about iterables, uh, which are those data sources that we use in for groups and other contexts. So basically, a very good definition that we can start with is that uh, iterable is something that's capable of being iterated, right? Uh, and actually, given the, the duck typing nature of the Python typing system, the dynamic nature of the Python uh, typing system, this is actually a very good definition. Because it, uh, being iterable in Python doesn't require formally declaring an interface or inheriting from some specific class. We're going to talk in more detail about what uh, exactly constitutes an iterable in Python. But let's first uh, see some iterables uh, as, an ex as examples. For instance, lots of data structures, built-in data structures and others that you can import from uh, external libraries are iterable. Like, uh, for instance, uh, string objects, the store class in Python 3, uh, is an iterable that will give you uh, individual Unicode characters. In context, the bytes uh, data structure will give you integers from 0 to, 2 point, uh, to 255. You also have tuples, dicts, sets, uh, files. When you open a file, see on the top, uh, on the top right of this screen, uh, I'm opening a text file, and then, then I can just iterate over it to get at the lines. Uh, that addict, the second example on this on this slide, addict shows uh, how you can iterate over the keys just by iterating over the the dict itself. Here, what I'm using is I'm using the list constructor to iterate over the over the dict to show the result, right? So uh, I have uh, if I do if I build a list from a dict, what I get is a, a list of the keys. If I want a list of the values, then I call d.values. And if I want a list of, of the items, the key value par, pairs, I call uh, d.items. Other things that you can do with iterables besides using them uh, in for loops or list constructors is, for instance, you can do parallel assignments, which is also something that existed in Clue. Uh, the for loop include allows the iterable to return uh, several items that would be assigned like this. Anyway, so on the top of this example, you see uh, on, the, on the right hand side, I just have a simple string with three characters, and then I, will, I, I, I do parallel assignment to a tuple of variables, ABC. Right? So this is called uh, popular the tuple unpacking although the proper name would be uh, iterable unpacking because the right-hand side can be any iterable. And that's what I'm showing on the second example here where I'm, going to sh where I'm showing that I can uh, uh, get at the elements generated by a generator expression, which is a little beast that we're going to be talking about uh, later. But anyway, it's another, a, a very different kind of iterable, but, but it still supports uh, that same kind of uh, multiple, uh, parallel assignment. Uh, here's the, an example of parallel assignment in for loops, which is one of the best uses for, uh, for this. I have a list of pairs, and then when I iterate over that list, I can declare, uh, or, or I can use in the for loop, uh, one variable for each item in the pairs. And then I already have access directly to those values. So uh, whenever you're using indexes in Python, sometimes, uh, often in, in the context of for loops or unpacking or so on, there's a ways, more expressive ways of doing it. So this is one example, right? I could have just iterated like for pair in pairs, but then I would have to use an index to reach at the individual parts of the, of the tuple. But when I do this, uh, like, like I'm showing this slide, uh, the, the code is more readable. Another example of something that you can do with, uh, with any iterable is that you can unpack an iterable when you use it to invoke a function. 
So for instance, in this example here, I have, the, uh, I have a, a function that will calculate the area of a triangle given the length of the three sides. And of course, I can call it by passing three arguments explicitly, like the first example shows, area of three, uh, comma, four, comma, five. But I can also have a tuple with the values, or any, any iterable really, with the values that I uh, need to pass to the function, and then I just pass uh, that value with a star prefix. And this will make uh, Python expand the iterable into the different arguments that the function needs. There's several uh, reduction functions, which are functions that will consume some finite iterable and return a scalar value. Like for instance, all will return true if all of the values in the iterable given to it are truthy, are true values in the, in the Python sense. Any will do the same if any of the values passed are truthy. Both all and any work with uh, 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 efficiently by doing uh, by aborting when the condition is uh, ascertained. So, for instance, for all, whenever it finds uh, uh, a, a false value, it will immediately stop iterating and uh, return the, the result. Uh, so, and. You also have max and min, which consume iterables and will give you the minimal and the maximal value. You have sum, which allows you to sum the items in an iterable. Uh, we also have sort and sorted, which are uh, two different uh, ways of sorting. But this is interesting to show how uh, when, when, you, when you're dealing with iterables, you have more general solutions. Uh, the sort method is a list method, so it, it only works with lists. And what it does is it, it sorts the list in place, right? On the other hand, the sorted built-in function will consume any iterable as long as it's a finite iterable, and then it will return uh, the result as a sorted list. And you can also pass uh, an argument called p that you can see on the uh, last three examples on this page, that uh, so the key argument uh, receives a function that will be applied to each uh, element in the iterable to produce the ordering criterion. So for instance, if I want to do a, a case insensitive uh, sort, I can pass key equals uh, stir dot lower, as you can see in the second example. And the third example, I am sorting by the length of the string. And in the last example, I am sorting by the reverse of the word. So that's why banana came out first, because it ends with an A, and cherry came out last, because it ends with a Y. Another interesting example of a, a, an iterable in, in the wild is in Django, you have this concept of query sets, and this, uh, th this slide show uh, an interactive session. There are screenshots from an interactive session where in the bug mode, I can actually uh, have access to this object called connection.queries, which shows the list of the uh, SQL queries that Django has sent to a database. And here I am assigning it to the Q variable just so it's easier to, to uh, type it afterwards. So Q is a reference to this connection.queries object and you can see that it starts empty. And then uh, here, uh, what I did is I in imported from everything from the modules, from the census.modules uh, module and I have this uh, model called county, and when I do dot objects dot all, uh, I would uh, this would be like a, a select to to get all of the counties in the database, right? And then I I have this uh, slice notation at the end because I actually want only want the first five uh, counties. But but as you see, when I build this expression, I actually already invoked the all methods, 
and then I apply the slicing uh, operation to that uh, results. But the interesting thing is uh, when I look at the Q variable, I see that the database was not touched at this time. And uh, so what I, what I have now on my hand is a, is a result set, but the result set is something that is iterable, but it's lazy. Uh, when I actually iterate over it, like I'm doing here, uh, then, and only then, when you look at the Q variable, you will see that the, 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 the select statement was actually sent to the database. So this is an example of a, uh, an iterable that, that behaves lazily. Not all iterables in Python are lazy, but many of them are. Um, the next, uh, in the rest of this presentation, I'm going to show you how to uh, create uh, lazy iterables. So uh, one good way of approaching this concept of the lazy iterables is to understand the iterator pat pattern. So uh, let's talk about the classic recipe for the iterator pattern from the original design patterns book. This is the diagram that they use there, but I actually much prefer this other diagram, which is from a, a poster, uh, the head first design patterns poster. Uh, so in this poster, you can see uh, that the woman there is the the client, the client. Uh, so her code, the client code will have, uh, uh, the, the client wants to access uh, the elements of two different uh, data structures. In this example, they're using Java for the example. One data structure is the array list and the other is, is the array. And there are different notations in Java to get at the items from an array list or an array. But the client doesn't need to know the difference because both are iterable, which means that she can uh, get an iterator for the array list and an iterator for the array, and both iterators implement the same interface, which is basically, crucially, the next method. So she, she knows that when she gets an iterator from an object, she can just call next and doesn't need to worry about how the data structure is organized inside. So like the definition on this slide shows, the iterator pattern provides a way to access the elements of an aggregate object sequentially without exposing its underlying representation. So that's the key idea. Now, what happens in, in, in Python with the for loop is that the for loop does the following. First, it will obtain an iterator, an iterator from the iterable. Okay, and then it will repeatedly invoke next on the iterator to retrieve the item, and then we will assign the item to the loop variable. So uh, this is basically how things work inside the for loop. The for loop does all of this for you. It will uh, obtain uh, the iterator from the iterable, and it will then use the iterator by invoking next on it. And the, the way the iterator signals that it's exhausted in Python is by raising an exception called stop iteration. Uh, so that is a, this, is, this is something that's a bit surprising for people from coming from Java, because in Java, uh, pretty, uh, pretty much every exception means something went wrong, but Python uses a lot of exceptions for si uh, signaling. And this is one example. Uh, so the stop iteration doesn't mean that something went wrong, but just that there's no more uh, values to produce. The iterator has no more variables to produce. So this is a crucial distinction and something that confuses people when they start thinking about this in more detail, the distinction between the iterable and the iterator. Uh, and Python has a convenience feature that is actually very useful, but that kind of confuses this issue. So let's start from the, the first definition. So the iterable implements the iterable interface, which in Python means implementing uh, an under under iter under under method, which we pronounce dunder iter. So the dunder iter method is the it is what you need to provide to fulfill the iterable interface, right? 
And when you call that Dunder iter method, you get an iterator, right? And the iterator, on the other hand, implements the iterator interface, which means implementing a Dunder next method. And the Dunder next method returns the next item in the series, or uh, it raises stop iteration to signal the end of the series. In the little UML diagram on this slide, you can see that uh, the that it so you see the, the, the iterable abstract class. I'm using the abstract class notation just to talk about because it is an, an abstract class in Python. Uh, so it implements well, it doesn't implement, but it defines the under iter uh, method, right? And what's interesting in Python, which doesn't happen in, in Java, is that the iterator abstract class inherits from iterable so uh, it implement it, it well it defines the dunder next method but it also has to uh, uh, define this dunder iter method and actually it, it doesn't have to define but it, do, it does define in the, the abstract iterator class what it does is it defines the dunder iter method like you see on the uh, right hand corner there Basically, the, the Dunder iter method in the iterator abstract class returns self. So this means that Python iterator are, all, are also iterable. It's a convenience. Uh, it allows you to put in the for loop in that last position after the in keyword in the for loop, either an iterable or an iterator, because Python will just try to fetch the Dunder iter and we will find that on the iterator as well. Okay, so this is a little bit confusing. The idea, basic idea is uh, every iterator is iterable, but not every iterable, basically no iterables in general are iterator, except the iterators themselves. Anyway, so let's see a, con a concrete example of the uh, iterator design pattern implemented. Let's suppose I want to model a train so when I instantiate a train passing an integer, I'm creating a train with that many cars. So in this example here, I, I created a train with three cars and I can iterate over it, right? So the T variable points to this train uh, instance and then I can iterate over it like that. So how do I uh, implement that using this, the, basic, the basic structure of the pattern as described in the design patterns book by Gamma at all. You can uh, you have the train class and the train class being iterable must implement the Dunder iter uh, method. And the Dunder iter method basically returns an iterator for the train. And I'm sorry, on this code here, I just noticed that the, the, I'm returning an instance of a, car, a class named in Portuguese. That's because this example was in Portuguese and I forgot to translate that line. Anyway, so uh, let's pretend that line actually says the Dunder iter method in the train class says return train iterator, right? Uh, so you instantiate the iterator and then the, the iterator class is defined as you see on the bottom half of the code, where you have uh, the, the constructor, the constructor, then the init, and the, then the next method. And I'm not going to go into the details of how this in, is implemented. The main idea is that the train is the iterable, so it implements the then the iter method, and uh, the, the, the then the iter method instantiates an iterable, an, an iterator, sorry, and the iterator class uh, implements then the next. So that's the overall idea of the pattern, right? Now Python has a shortcut for doing this, uh, which we call generator functions. Uh, and Michael Scott of the book, uh, the author of the book, uh, Programming Language uh, Pragmatics, I think, uh, calls them true iterators. So let's take a look at those true iterators. 
So the way you write uh, a generator function in Python is basically you, you write a function that has the use keyword in the body. This is something that I don't like about this, the syntax of Python. Uh, when this feature was discussed, somebody uh, suggested that uh, a new keyword should be introduced instead of def for this case. Here, when, whenever you uh, you can you can iterate over over the invocation of a generator function, right? As you see there, for i in gen one two three print i. So basically, I invoke the generator function, and what I, what I get back is a generator, and the generator is a, a, an iterator. As you can see in the middle of this example, if I call the, 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 the generator function uh, and assign the result to a, var a, var a variable, and then you inspect the variable, you can see that the variable is actually a generate who actually is a reference to a generator object, right? And if you want to play with the generator object directly uh, in the way that the for loop does for you, you basically call next on it. So the first time I call next G, I get one. The second time I get two. The third time I get three. And the last time I get uh, the stop iteration exception, right? This is kind of a, this is a very silly example, but it's interesting because the body of this function just has three U's. And basically this is a generator that will just use three values, right? When the, when the, the, the body of this function falls through, then Python itself will raise this stop iteration exception. The second example here uh, is a little bit more detailed. Uh, it has, I, I, I added some print statements to the generator function so, so that we can see step by step what is going on, right? So if I iterate over the gen AB function with a for statement, I will just see starting, then the letter A, continuing, the letter B, and then the end. Now, if I actually uh, just invoke the gen AB function and assign it to a variable, then what happens is uh, you get this generator object, and then when you call next G, what happens is you see starting and then the, the A character. And what just happened was that the body of the function was executed uh, from the top to the first use. And then the, the function is basically frozen. So it's, it, it remains in a suspended state. And then the, the, my client code can continue. Uh, so, and then when I call next G again, what happens is the body of the function executes going through the print continuing uh, line, and then it gets at the, the second yield uh, uh, statement that will use the B character, and then I see the output of continuing and the B character. And now the, 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 the function is frozen right after the yield over there. And then when I actually call next G again, you can see the output of the print statement, the last print statement that shows the end, and then uh, Python raises the stop iteration exception. Right. So this is the idea, the idea of the iterator that uh, uh, was introduced in the Clue language. Uh, the idea of a function that had, they, they also used the yield keyword, and they, it had the same semantics of a function that you run. When you call it, you get, you get an iterator object, and when you invoke next on the iterator object, you basically get, 
you run the body of the function until the next yield, and then it's suspended, and again and again. Except that in Clue, as far as I could uh, discover, there was no way to, inv to actually invoke the, the, the iterator function directly. You could only invoke it in the context of a for loop. So uh, Python made uh, this iterator, this generator idea, or this iterator idea, more of a first-class concept where you can actually invoke the function and get the generator back and assign it to a, to a, a variable, right? Um, but it basically, the way the control flow worked was exactly the same in Clue, and they also used the U keyword. Uh, a common example to demonstrate the uh, working of uh, generators to implement a Fibonacci generator, which is interesting because it's an infinite series, right? So it emphasizes the difference between a generator and the classic iterator pattern because the classic iterator pattern is designed to iterate over elements of a collection, right? So there's this duct, there's some data structure and the iterator will uh, traverse this data, data structure yielding items from it. And the generator is more general in the sense that it doesn't have to, uh, it doesn't have, it doesn't depend on an external data structure. It can, it can just produce items out of thin air. Uh, another example of, of, of Fibonacci, the second example uh, will allow you to tell it how many items you want. And another example is a, a, an arithmetic progression paper. It's kind of similar to the range function in Python, except that the range function only deals with integers. And this is also an example of uh, the power of uh, duct typing, because I only have this simple, def this single definition, and depending on the type of the increments or the other uh, arguments, I get different results. Like the second example here, I'm doing uh, a prog arithmetic progression with decimals, for example. Anyway, now you can also apply that idea of the generator function to simplify the implementation of that train example that we were talking about earlier. So this demonstrates that what happened was Python incorporated the iterator pattern as a language feature, right? So this is an example of a train that's iterable like the other one was, except that it's much shorter. Look at the code uh, side by side, right? Uh, so basically, since Python uh, introduced the yield keyword in 2001, the classic iterator recipe is uh, obsolete, became obsolete in the Python language. Nobody would ever implement the left-hand side code. <clears throat> so uh, Python has a lot of built-in generators, like functions such as enumerate, filter, map, and reverse, and, and zip, which, by the way, zip has nothing to do with uh, data compression, but it has everything to do with the zipper fastener uh, uh, because basically it interleaves uh, two or more sequences of items. We're going to show it in a moment. So one thing that happened in the migration between Python 2 and Python 3 was that uh, Python 3 uses a lot more generators than Python 2 used, uh, used to do. For instance, in Python 2, zip, map, and filter uh, were built-in functions that returned lists. So you can see, for instance, the zip function over there, basically it will consume uh, several iterables in parallel and return uh, a list of tup uh, or tuples. So for instance, uh, if I zip a the string ABC and that uh, L list with three items, what I get back is a list with uh, one uh, element from each, uh, with a list of pairs where each pair is, is made from one element from each uh, iterable, right? Uh, map uh, produces a, a list by uh, applying a function to the elements of, of an iterable, and filter also does the same. In this case here, passing none, I get uh, 
um, a list of the non zero or the, the, the truthy elements of the list. Anyway, these are not generators. So I want to emphasize, but I want to show uh, the, my, my point here is that those three functions became generators in Python 3. So now if you try to use them in Python 3, what you get back are, are uh, generator objects. And then if you actually want to build the, the data structures that you, you received before in Python 2, you just call the, prop, the appropriate constructor like a uh, Yeah, so this is what I'm showing here. The last example, for instance, on this slide shows building a dict from, a, from the zip of, of a, a, a string and a list of numbers. Right? Uh, another source of many gen interesting generators is the ether 2 standard module. It has generators that are infinite generators, like the count generator that just uh, uh, produces integers uh, from zero to the largest integer representable uh, by the machine, which is really large in the case of Python because it, it uses an internal representation that's not limited to the word size. You also have generators that consume multiple iterables, uh, uh, returning a new uh, generator, like the chain, T, anyway. Generators that filter or bundle items, like for instance, compress, will, will, will consume an, iter an iterable of booleans and another iterable, and it will just yield the, uh, yield the value from the second iterable when the first one is truthy. Uh, anyway, these are very powerful, and the, the, document, the Python documentation has uh, it's very good examples showing how these work. The, uh, there's also generators that rearrange items, like uh, that generate permutations, combinations, and some of, and other things like that. Many of these functions were inspired by the Haskell language, by the way. There's also a new syntax. Uh, not so new anymore, but anyway, there's a syntax for building a generator from an expression. So, uh, first, uh, Python introduced this concept of comprehension, the syntax for list comprehension, which is basically a syntax for building a list, as you can see here. Uh, so, uh, the L list is built by, by this expression that is uh, or C for C in S, meaning the, the, the code of the C character for, for each C character in, in the string S, right? And so uh, the same notation, if you use parentheses instead of brackets, it will produce a generator object. So now you have uh, a lazy iterator. Instead of actually building a list, you have an, an iterator that will generate those same items on demand. Right. You can also, of course, uh, implement that simple train example using a generator expression instead of a, a generator function. So, uh, in the end, the really the, the, the Pythonic definition of iterable is uh, actually an object from which the iter built-in function can build, can build an iterator. So the, the for loop machinery uses the iter function internally, and the way uh, that works is uh, the first thing that the iter function tries to do with the object that it receives is to find if it has a under iter method. And if it does, then it will invoke that and return the, the iterator. Right, but the interesting thing, which makes uh, Python more flexible, is that uh, you can also uh, the iter function can also deal with uh, sequences that do not implement the dunder iter method, but implement the but implement the dunder get item method. Dunder get item is how Python implements. Uh, uh, accessing in, uh, items using uh, integer indexes from zero. So if you have a data structure that implements uh, 
Dundergear item, and uh, that Dundergear item works with zero based indexes. The iter function can also build uh, uh, an iterable from that, an, an iterator from that. So to, to wrap up, I'm going to talk about a, a case study that uh, illustrates the use of generator functions to deal with uh, large data sets. So I used to work at, a, at a, an institution that operated a digital library that used a database called ISIS. So ISIS is a, data, is a document database that was created by UNESCO about 30 years ago. And uh, one of my tasks there was to uh, research the possibility of migrating the large data sets that we had in ISIS to uh, a, a more modern uh, document database such as MongoDB or CouchDB. And in order to do that, I created this uh, utility called uh, ISIS to JSON, and it was written in Python 2.7. Uh, at the time, uh, and let me, I'm going to describe the, 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 the problem I was trying to solve and how I solved it. So the idea is, I, I have a main loop in this program. I'm going to zoom into that uh, listing on the right side. But anyway, this is just an overview of the code. I have a, I have a main loop that will output uh, JSON records to a file, right? And uh, I also have uh, to read, I need to read records from the, the original ACES database, right? So uh, how can I do that without coupling the logic of reading with the logic of writing? I could read everything into memory and then write to disk, but I had data sets that would not fit in memory, so I couldn't do that. So one solution would be to interleave, actually, right? To have a for loop that will iterate over the input and generate the output. But this is, this is not very good because it mixes the logic of handling the input uh, records with the logic of making the output records. Uh, and what if I have to support another way of doing that, another way of importing? Right? So if I have a second uh, way of importing, then I have three uh, different logics in the same loop. So this, is, this becomes really confusing. So the way I solved it was to split the program into uh, functions, uh, into basically four functions. There's the main function, the function that writes the JSON array, and the two functions on the top of this slide, which actually are uh, generator functions that will read the records in different formats. So let's zoom in the main function. So what happens with the main function is, uh, depending on the suffix of the input file, if it ends with uh, .nst, then it will select the iter iso records uh, function to read that. But if it ends with a, uh, uh, if it doesn't use that extension, then it will use the ether uh, ISO records. Okay. So let's take a look at the function that writes the records. This function here is the one that writes the record. It gets as the first argument the generator function that it, that it will use to iterate, and then it, as you can see, it has a for loop that will. Uh, iterate over the iter records function, right? Now, the the first iterator for, uh, generator function called iter iso records uh, basically uh, iterates over the input records, creates an empty dictionary, populates it with the data in one record, and then it will use that fields dictionary, right? The other function is similarly structured, except that it's more complicated because the other API is more complicated. But anyway, it will, uh, for each item, in, for each record in the input, will create an empty dict, populate it, and use it. Right. So now what I have is this situation where I can actually plug in different uh, iterator function or general uh, generator functions 
to provide the input records for the other function that will output them, right? And now the, the program became more extensible because if I need to, in, to support a new input format, all I have to do is create a new uh, generator function. Anyway, so uh, this is pretty much the end of my talk. I just want to mention a few things that I did not talk about on purpose because Python generators, a Python generator can also be used as, as coroutines. And David Beasley, who is a, a popular uh, Python speaker and book author, says that coroutines are not related to iteration. So it actually, it's actually a good idea if, if you're new to this subject to study and get really comfortable with generators be before talking about, before studying coroutines, which are actually another way of doing generators for doing very different things. And uh, if you look at the documentation for generator objects in Python, you will see that they implement a send method. But again, the same method is used uh, to use generators as coroutines. Uh, and in that scenario, the, the, the generators actually become co data consumers. So it's really a very different uh, uh, usage pattern. And again, you can also, and the, la the last thing I did not talk about was the fact that the U keyword can also be used a, on the right-hand side of an assignment to get data from a send call. But again, I think since Python 3.5, we, we also we, we have new syntax for defining coroutines, which is the async def uh, uh, keyword and all the and, and the await keyword, and this is uh, much better because then it, finally we have a way of differentiating coroutines from generators in Python. So basically, this is what I had to show you today. And I guess we're going to uh, go into Q&A. And I'm going to uh, hand it over to Alexei here. Thank you, Luciano, for the brilliant presentation. So let's move on to some questions and answers now. Um, we have a couple of questions on, on uh, Python version. So uh, does everything that you say here apply both to Python 2 and Python 3, or what are the differences in that sense? Yeah, as, as I mentioned in one of the slides, uh, the U keyword was introduced in Python 2.2 .2 in 2001. So pretty much everything that I've shown here uh, works, has been working with Python for a long time already. Uh, maybe there are some details, but mostly everything that I'm showing here, certainly everything that I'm showing here applies with, with to, to Python 2.7 as well, with minor differences, but the, the, the functionality is there. Maybe there's different ways of uh, invoking things, but the, the whole functionality is available in Python 2.7 as well. Thank you. Uh, we've got another couple of ones related to uh, generator uh, state and the internal management of state. So, for example, um, if th does the generator get reset when I exit uh, a for loop, for example, or can I use the same generator in different contexts simultaneously without having them share state? And uh, w what does happen? Do, do they interfere with each other? Well, thanks a lot for those questions. Yeah, so for, w one thing that's interesting to think about is that the way iterators are implemented in the language is a result of the fact that the stack frames in a Python program are actually stored in, in the heap of the C implementation, right? So the, uh, each stack frame in Python is a, is a data structure that is held on the heap of the, uh, of the C uh, implementation of Python. So this means that Python can hold on to a frame, a frame however long it needs. And this is how you, you can, uh, this is how it's possible to suspend uh, the, the operation of, a, of a, a generator on the yield. So uh, what was the second part? Mm, let's see. 
Oh yeah, about sharing. Okay, about resetting. Yeah, this. Okay, first of all, there's no way of resetting a generator. If, once it's exhausted, you have to just throw it away. And basically, what this is what happens implicitly in a for loop, because in the for loop, the the hand the Python will call the the iterable and obtain the generator, and we will hold on to a, to, to to a reference to that generator in an internal reference. Which will be discarded as soon as the as the for loop exits. So at that time, there will be no more references to that uh, generator object, and it will be garbage collected, right? Uh, there is no way of resetting the uh, generator, so you just have to rebuild it if you need. And there, and there, there, there was another part about about different uh, uh, parts of the program accessing the same generator. And that's really interesting because one of the things that I, I was thinking about when I was studying this was, why is it that the, the iterator design pattern uh, requires you to implement next on this other class? Why can't I make all of my objects not only iterable but also iterators of themselves by implementing next on the collection? Think about this. And the reason why this is not done is because you actually want to be able to have multiple iterations going on on the same data structure. So each iterate, if each iterator, each iteration will get its own generator object or its its own iterator, and so you will have different states. So this allows multiple parts of the program to traverse the same data structure uh, independently. Uh, yeah, I, I guess this is basically what was asked. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, and there's another question around uh, efficiency, Luciano. So are generators efficient with NumPy arrays? Do they match the efficiency of array operations, for example? Well, this is, this is very interesting because uh, uh, one of the, the things that I wanted to, to, to tell you about was uh, how to transpose? This is actually uh, something that was in the in the uh, in the abstract of this talk. So let me show you something here. Uh, I have. Can you? I, I don't know if you can see the screen. I am uh, zooming in now. If it's is it a good size? So anyway. Uh, Let's say I have uh, I have a, a NumPy array, and I can iterate over it. So NumPy arrays are iterable, right? So I'm, I'm showing the, the rows. And this is another way of doing that. Uh, no, this is a way of transposing it, right? So this is very interesting. You use the zip function with the star. And what happens is it will iterate over the A array to get the arguments. And the arguments then will be the different rows. And zip will iterate over them in parallel. And the result of this is basically to transpose, as you can see here. Right? Now, the interesting thing is NumPy is amazingly optimized. And one of the things that it has is there's this T attribute, which is not even a method that you call on an array and it gives you a, the, trans, the trans, transposed array. And the way this is implemented is basically this T, this T attribute gives you a, a different view on the same data. There is no copying going on here. It will just, you know, basically uh, give you an, another array, which is basically a different set of metadata describing the same bytes in memory and telling the, 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 the interpreter to understand those bytes as uh, organized in rows instead of columns or something like that. So, so yeah, uh, you can use those, uh, you can use, use iterators with NumPy a lot, and they are very useful, but actually NumPy
So we apologize to all the attendees. It seems like we may have lost uh, Luciano for a moment. I'm going to give it another few seconds, and otherwise we will uh, close out today and thank all of you for attending. Okay, again, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today, and uh, apologies for the last-minute uh, technical difficulties. Uh, for those remaining, uh, if you could fill out the survey that we have that will pop up on your screen um, in the next uh, few moments, that would be great. Um, I'd like to thank Luciano Hamayo uh, and uh, also, Alexi Boas for presenting today it was a fantastic event, and everybody here for attending. This webinar is being archived and will be made available within the next uh, one to two days. Please check back on the ACM Learning Center at learning.acm.org, and also look out for notifications about the recording webinar. Thanks very much.